the, the list directions originally in a security initiative roundtable uh, titled Managing the Risk of a Military Collision in the Persian Gulf from Where to Start. Um, I'm Luigi Narbone, I'm the director of the Middle East Directions Program. And uh, Farzan, please introduce yourself. Hello, everyone. Thanks for joining us and thanks for our panelists. I'm Abdurrasul Deep Salar, the um, co leader of Regional Security Initiative. Uh, happy to have you all here. So, um, this topic today is particularly uh, timely. Uh, we think that while the political attention in Washington and elsewhere is focusing on how to uh, restart the diplomatic process uh, with, with Iran. The, we have witnessed over the past uh, year, at least uh, during the last period of the Trump administration, uh, increasing tension in the, in the region with the uh, growing risk of uh, military escalation and including military uh, collision and all out war. So that uh, risk is still present, especially because of the lack of uh, uh, communication channels uh, at all levels, uh, including, uh, of course, at the military level. And uh, the topic today is uh, whether there are measures could be introduced to reduce the, the level of uncertainty and therefore reduce the risk of uh, inadvertent uh, escalation, escalatory dynamics that lead to to conflict. We have a very distinguished panel uh, today to discuss this uh, timely issue. Uh, I uh, start by introducing the panelists. Um, Mr. Giovanni Romani, head of the MENA section at the NATO organization headquarters in Brussels. Um, uh, Sanam Vakil, uh, deputy director of the Middle East uh, Nor uh, North Africa program at Chatham House. Massa Rui is a research fellow for Iran and Turkey and the Levant at the Institute for National Strategic Studies at the National Defense in Industry in University, sorry. And Titi Erasto is a senior researcher in the CIPRI Nuclear Disarmament Arms Control and Non-Proliferation Program um, at CIPRI. So um, we have um, four panelists to discuss the topic and I would uh, um, perhaps uh, give uh, 10 minutes each to start with uh, a presentation, uh, starting with uh, uh, Mr. Giovanni Romani. Mr. Giovanni Romani, the floor is yours. Before I jump to our main topic, uh, um, I would like to uh, start with some uh, important considerations. So NATO has a wide network of partners in the Middle East and North Africa, and actually are responsible for uh, maintaining this, uh, this network. And this, uh, uh, these networks are meant to bring together states that are facing common security challenges, uh, such as terrorism, uh, proliferation of light weapons, and so on. And um, talking about the Gulf, uh, which is the subject of today's uh, seminar, the, our partners are Iraq, where you probably know we have an important NATO mission, the NATO mission in Iraq. It's a non-combat training and capacity building mission conducted in full respect of uh, the Iraq so sovereignty and territorial integrity. The other partners are Kuwait, Bahrain, Qatar, and the UAE. The, these four are members of the so-called Istanbul Cooperation Initiative, which was launched uh, 16 years ago. NATO also has a more limited engagement with uh, Saudi Arabia and Oman. Uh, they, for example, participate in activities and courses uh, we organize in, the, uh, in a center that we have in Kuwait, uh, the so-called NATO ICI Regional Center. Iran is not a NATO partner. And allies have different approaches vis-a-vis uh, -vis Iran. Uh, and, um, and you probably know the NATO uh, official policy is crafted by 30 allies and we have a mechanism of uh, consensus. So if we go down to what is that all 30 NATO allies agree about Iran, uh, we can go back to the Brussels communique and um, which uh, followed the summit in 2018 uh, and there was language on this. Uh, uh, and the allies expressed concern about the Iranian ballistic missile uh, program and uh, about the uh, Iran's uh, destabilizing activities in the wider uh, Middle East region, and also reiterated a commitment to permanently ensuring that Iran's nuclear program remains 
peaceful. So this is 2018, but I believe this measure, this measure still stands today. And, um, and the most relevant point is uh, certainly a disarmament. So please allow me to expand a little bit on NATO position on, the, on this matter. The Alliance has been at the forefront of nuclear disarmament for decades. And the ultimate goal of NATO is to see a world free of nuclear weapons. And uh, it's also thanks to NATO efforts that we have reduced the number of nuclear weapons in Europe by more than 90% over the past 30 years. But in an uncertain world, these weapons continue to play a vital role in preserving peace. You know that only three NATO allies US, UK, and France possess nuclear weapons, but all NATO allies benefit from the security that uh, these weapons uh, guarantee and provide. A nuclear deterrent is our strongest deterrent. It has preserved peace in Europe for more than 70 years. And at the time when threats to our security are more complex and more un unpredictable than ever before, we need a credible nuclear deterrent combined with effective as control. At the same time, there are legitimate concerns about uh, nuclear weapons and their proliferation. Russia and China are investing heavily in sophisticated and diverse nuclear arsenal. And North Korea continues its nuclear expansion. And Iran also represents a concern. With this, the prospect for complete nuclear disarmament seems remote, but is not uh, less relevant. And we will continue to pursue nuclear as control and disarmament as a matter of urgency. Yet we need to do this in a balanced, reciprocal and verifiable way. So, and I will make three points about this. First, we must continue to invest in the tools that we have, the, the treaty that we have, like the Treaty on Non-Proliferation of Nuclear Weapons, the NPT. It's uh, 50 years old uh, and uh, all uh, NATO allies strongly support it. Uh, uh, because they successfully limited the global spread of nuclear weapons uh, uh, with the disposal over 50 years of tens of thousands of uh, nuclear weapons. It has also provided a framework for countries like Belarus, Kazakhstan, South Africa, Ukraine to abandon the nuclear programs. It has established a robust safeguard and verification regime allowing non-nuclear weapon states to take advantage of peaceful uses of nuclear energy. But these matters require sustained commitment and effort by everybody, and certainly by NATO. Some look at the treaty on the provision of nuclear weapons or the ban treaty as an alternative solution to eliminate all nuclear weapons. This is an idea that at first glance seems wonderful. But the reality is that it will not work as the ban treaty has no mechanism to ensure the balanced reduction of weapons and no mechanism for verification. Moreover, it hasn't been signed by any state that possesses nuclear weapons. Simply giving up our deterrence uh, without any guarantee that others will do the same uh, is uh, a very dangerous option for NATO. A world where Russia, China, North Korea, and others have nuclear weapons uh, and NATO does not, is not a safer world. It will leave us vulnerable to pressure and attack and it would undermine the security of the alliance. The second point I want to make, we need to preserve the bilateral arms control regime between the United States and Russia, which uh, still have by far the largest nuclear arsenals in the world. They hold uh, a special responsibility to lead the way in nuclear arms control and disarmament. When the first START treaty entered into force in 94, the US and Russia were limited to 6,000 deployed nuclear weapon, uh, warheads each. Now with the new START, uh, we're down to 1,550 deploy strategic warheads each. For the US, consider this is a drastic reduction from over 30,000 during the Cold War. Now the future of New START is also at stake. It expires uh, the 5th of February in three days. So we should not find ourselves in a situation where we have uh, no treaty limiting the number of strategic uh, nuclear weapons. That's why we welcome President Biden's announcement and his intention to seek an extension of the New START. The NATO Secretary General has stated repeatedly that we should not end up in a situation where we have no agreement, no limitation whatsoever on the number of nuclear warheads. NATO allies have made it clear that they all support the New START agreement because it has been also uh, of great importance for us all. NATO has been on the forefront of our control 
and uh, we have seen the, the needs of important treaties such, uh, such as the INF. We should avoid and prevent uh, the demise of the new start. The third point I want to make is that uh, the extension of the new start uh, is not uh, the end. It should be the beginning <clears> of <throat> renewed effort to strengthen international arms control, to look into how we can cover more weapon systems, also include more nations, for example, China. And verification is, of course, of great importance. In summary, we, we must develop a global nuclear arms control regime suited to, uh, to uh, the current multipolar world, a regime that takes uh, account of the rise of new powers uh, and that allows for more uh, uh, transparency and predictability, as the ambassador was referring to. Zooming back to uh, US, uh, Iran, uh, um, we, we saw the recent appointment of uh, Rob Malley, uh, which we welcome uh, as he's one of the architects of the JCPOE. And um, uh, back in 2015, uh, so uh, it's a clear indication of uh, the Biden administration appetite to renegotiate the deal. Iran has warned that President Biden's administration must act soon to revive the treaty, uh, but it refuses to scale back nuclear activity unless the US per eases uh, 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 former President Trump's sanctions. And I believe the murder of uh, uh, Fakizade might add to the complexity to reach a win-win agreement, but I think it will be in everyone's interest to get there. Let me add a thought on maritime security, which was also in the theme of this seminar, um, and the importance to ensure the freedom of navigation in the Gulf. Uh, several allies are engaged in this matter, but not NATO as such. Now, let, let me move uh, now to um, the, the subject I started with, which is NATO's partnership in the, um, in the region. The rationale behind our cooperation is that uh, transatlantic security cannot be divorced from security in the Middle East and North Africa. And our cooperation focuses on supporting our partners on capacity building and enhancing their resilience against security threats. It rests on uh, two pillars of political dialogue and practical cooperation. Such cooperation has flourished over the years and NATO has currently one permanent presence in Kuwait with the NATO uh, ICI Regional Center. Most recently, foreign ministers uh, of NATO agreed uh, to step up uh, our uh, cooperation with our partners in the MENA region. And we aim at improving the quality of, uh, of uh, what we're doing so far, uh, increasing uh, mobile training teams uh, that, uh, uh, that go, go to the region uh, uh, to deliver training, uh, steering military cooperation jointly and establish a much stronger partnership. Ministers also agreed uh, in a different area, uh, which is the Sahel, the NATO should look into a potential engagement also in Sahel, based on the clear understanding of the situation on the ground. So basically we do have uh, in Middle East and North Africa, a partnership agreement in, um, that goes from Mauritania to uh, Israel, Jordan uh, and, and Egypt uh, and, and, the, and the North African countries and another one in the Gulf. But in Sahel for the moment, we were only present in the Mauritania. So now there's, a, the, there's some thinking about doing more uh, in the broader Sahel region. So um, to, to sum up, um, there are two points I would like uh, for you to retain from this chat. Uh, the first is that NATO is committed to doing its part on us control while, while maintaining its deterrence posture and, and NATO also want to wants to contribute to increasing transparency and predictability. The second point is uh, NATO's engagement in cooperative security uh, with its partners in the Gulf and elsewhere uh, in a mutually beneficial relationship to help uh, both uh, NATO allies and partners uh, to be uh, safer. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Mr. Mr. Romani, for this comprehensive overview on the prospect for uh, arms control and uh, for the NATO and NATO partnerships uh, in enhancing also the security of partners uh, in, in the MENA region. I would now move to Sanam Vakil uh, to, uh, for, for a presentation. Please, Sanam. Thank you very much, Ambassador Narbonne and to Farzam for this invitation. It's a pleasure to be here today. Um, looking forward to the discussion. Um, happy to share my, my uh, few thoughts on 
um, prospects and processes for de-escalation uh, between US and Iran. Um, I see uh, the diplomatic pathway that is ahead of us um, as a very um, unique opportunity um, for de-escalation after uh, the past four year period um, where we saw uh, the Trump administration obviously pursue a confrontational pathway um, and uh, impose maximum pressure uh, sanctions um, on the Islamic Republic. Um, this unique moment, I think, um, is one uh, where um, we see um, allies um, coming together uh, multilaterally to um, try uh, a new pathway or um, uh, perhaps um, address uh, regional challenges um, in a collaborative uh, manner. Um, and so what I um, intend to do is look at uh, the two processes that I see before uh, the international community. The first being um, the uh, the process um, of return to the JCPOA, um, and then the secondary process um, that I um, expect uh, um, based on statements from um, uh, political uh, leaders in, in many capitals around the world, the secondary process being um, uh, the uh, regional process um, that is necessary um, in order not uh, to strengthen and lengthen the, the nuclear agreement between Iran and the international community, but also ultimately to address the issue of conflict um, management um, and a lack of uh, regional security infrastructure architecture where regional states can independently manage um, and can contain um, uh, conflicts uh, among themselves. Um, so uh, to get started first, um, we know uh, quite clearly that uh, both uh, Tehran and Washington have indicated um, that they um, are um, intend to return to the JCPOA. Um, very clear statements have come from uh, the Biden administration, uh, even from before the inauguration this January. Um, and now as the Biden team is getting into place, uh, we have a clearer indication of um, what that process um, uh, is going to look like. Although we're of course waiting um, as um, new appointees will take up their positions for further de details. But in essence, um, the Biden administration has indicated that uh, they um, see the JCPOA as um, a unique framework and mechanism to manage Iran's um, accelerating nuclear program and um, constrain Iran's nuclear ambitions. Um, and so as a first step, uh, this is a process um, that uh, they would uh, like to uh, return to um, really because from the US perspective, um, nuclear uh, proliferation uh, and the acceleration of Iran's nuclear program is seen as a wider international threat. Um, but statements have been made to suggest that uh, the JCPOA um, in itself um, is obviously fragile. It's been made vulnerable um, by its fragility, um, that uh, the deal is limited in scope and scale. And in order to um, prevent this sort of back to the future moment that we continue to find ourselves um, in vis-a-vis -vis, uh, Iran, um, the deal must be strengthened and lengthened. Um, and uh, this has been made clear in statements from Secretary of State Anthony Blinken. Um, uh, uh, and uh, in the coming weeks, I'm sure we will hear what that process is going to be. Um, in order to return to the JCPOA and in, in order to return to this compliance for compliance based model that has been suggested, though, um, the, the parties to the agreement um, must uh, synchronize um, or uh, manage uh, the timing of this process, um, uh, the uh, sequence of this process, and um, also agree upon you know, further steps in order to insulate and protect the JCPOA. So I suspect for, for the coming months ahead of us, um, timing and sequencing and follow-on negotiations are um, all gonna be discussed um, uh, between the parties. Um, right now, as we are in this sort of public domain, we are watching specifically um, the JCPOA signatories um, uh, signal each other in, in, towards their intentions um, and their willingness to compromise. Um, and this is, very, this is playing out um, in a very important and very sort of controlled, moderated manner. Um, I, I think above all, stressing um, the desire of all of the parties uh, to protect the JCPOA. 
as it stands. And, and this also includes Iran um, that has had um, an incredibly um, challenging year um, or a couple of years, uh, not just um, uh, trying to weather uh, the impact of COVID, but weathering that impact amid um, an overwhelming number of sanctions. The designations imposed on the Islamic Republic since May 2018 are over 1,500. Um, really constraining Tehran's um, uh, banking ties, uh, trading ties with the wider international community. And, and of course, the strain has very much impacted uh, the lives and livelihood of ordinary Iranians. Um, so, you know, it's in this moment uh, that uh, the Islamic Republic also has an opportunity to uh, return to the JCPOA, uh, return back uh, to compliance as it has accelerated um, nuclear enrichment um, and accelerated processing and facilities that were previously closed. Um, in exchange for sanctions relief. And, and on Tehran's side, you're also hearing posturing um, with regards to who is going to go first and what um, Iran seeks to gain in this process. And um, what was originally, um, what we're seeing uh, play out is really quite interesting because uh, the issue of timing has been um, really elevated in Tehran um, uh, due to domestic politics, the domestic climate in Iran that has hardened away from President Rouhani's approach um, of uh, um, reliance on Europe and, and engagement um, uh, with the P5 plus one to a much more hardline uh, position. Um, and we have seen um, uh, the policymakers in Tehran uh, take, um, uh, try to use um, domestic dynamics as a vehicle to pressure the international community for a quick return, a rapid return to the JCPOA. Um, Iran's parliament um, recently imposed legislation that would demand um, some sort of action, if not sanctions relief by February 21st of this year, for example, um, as, a, as leverage and pressure. Um, uh, and uh, um, this is, of course, uh, going to be a date to keep in mind as we watch uh, the dynamics and, and the discussions unfold because the Biden administration has indicated that they intend to actually take their time. Another issue of timing that is important, um, I think, to elevate is that um, Iran is also uh, got an election clock ticking. Um, in June of this year, they will be holding presidential elections. Um, and uh, there are many analysts, um, myself included, who um, suggest that um, uh, sanctions relief and uh, sort of positive um, economic and political climate um, can impact uh, domestic uh, participation in the elections. Um, I don't think that um, uh, the US policymakers are going to um, pay as much heed to this um, as perhaps uh, Iranian policymakers or reformist moderate policymakers around President Rouhani would like. Um, but nevertheless, this election clock is factoring into uh, this, uh, this JCPOA reentry process as well. Um, at the same time, of course, we also hear that Iran is rapidly increasing its enrichment levels, and this adds another layer of urgency to um, the negotiations and how this process unfolds. And finally, in terms of timing, um, it's important to consider the um, uh, the process of sanctions relief that would be granted towards Iran. Um, Iran has stated quite um, overtly that it would like um, some sort of uh, compensation. Um, and of course, the um, intent or the um, interpretation of con compensation can be quite strict or it can be quite liberal. Um, but sanctions relief and what that process, uh, how that process um, unfolds is also important because the US government um, will have to review the 1500 sanction designations that have been posed on Iran and decide which ones are nuclear related and which ones um, actually pertain to regional issues, terror related issues and human rights related issues. This in itself will require a negotiation um, of its own, uh, again, through the JCPOA uh, process, the dispute resolution mechanism. Um, I suspect this process is, of course, going to take many months um, and perhaps um, uh, is not going to sort of meet a, a lot of the expectations and pressure um, to uh, see a quick re-entry. Um, we are seeing signaling coming from Washington that they would prefer to take their time, consolidate their portfolios, work with members of Congress, as well as assure um, American partners in the Middle East that they don't intend uh, to... 
return to the status quo of 2015 and actually intend to build a more sustainable JCPOA. Um, so uh, the, while this process is unfolding, um, I suspect a regional process um, is also um, uh, important uh, to lay out and discuss. Um, the sequencing of this regional process is also important um, because above all, um, regional actors that very much um, saw the JCPOA as a vehicle um, that enabled Iran's regional influence and regional um, interference beyond its borders would like um, to prevent uh, that same um, pathway from repeating itself. So you, you, we have seen very vocal um, opposition to a quick return to the JCPOA from countries like Israel, from the United Emir Arab Emirates and Saudi Arabia, uh, the three of which uh, would like uh, the Biden administration um, not only to take their time, but actually to use sanctions leverage um, in, to pressure Iran to alter its regional behavior of supporting uh, proxy groups around the region, um, but also to make concessions um, with regards to its ballistic missile program. Um, thinking about these issues are almost more difficult than the JCPOA reentry process, quite frankly. Um, and this is an area where I am spending a lot of time uh, conducting research and focusing uh, my work right now. Um, this process um, really, uh, I see much more difficult to unlock um, because uh, regional states, I think, assume that they can uh, sit down um, and have this conversation with Iran and perhaps see the Islamic Republic make concessions um, in exchange for sanctions relief. And um, that in, in, in a region where there has been so much confrontation and tensions and sort of sedimenting of um, uh, enmity um, over a number of decades, um, it, it's very hard to see uh, compromises or concessions being made um, within this regard. So then, you know, how can we address regional issues if it can't be done through pressure um, and, and through the incentives of sanctions relief? Um, in, a, in a report that I'm about to publish at Chatham House, um, we recommend that regional issues have to be broken apart. Um, broken apart uh, by addressing the JCPOA on the one hand, but at the same time, regionalizing um, the, uh, the hot conflicts of the Middle East um, involving um, multilateral um, uh, actors um, that are involved in each of these conflicts, um, and through these discussions, um, address uh, the multiple and sort of interlayered, uh, interlocked uh, regional issues relating to Iran and relating to Iran's um, influence or an interference in some of these countries alongside its proliferation of weapons um, inside these countries, but at the same time also addressing other countries' involvement in these countries. And by regionalizing these discussions, you sort of dial down um, the tensions and, and and try to create a more level playing field among um, all of the actors. One area, of course, um, that analysts repeatedly point to is Yemen as being um, a, 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 an area where there is perhaps greater um, greater will and opportunity um, to uh, bring actors together um, in such a process. But I think that beyond that, um, there are, are also opportunities uh, to have multilateral discussions in, in Syria um, and, of course, uh, with regards to Palestine as well. Um, a third layer that I, I see is really critical and one where um, I think that uh, Europe um, has a, a critical role to play is in the confidence building um, measure space um, that is really, um, in my view, essential uh, to building back um, uh, decades of lost trust and um, uh, building sort of a level playing field of cooperation. Confidence building measures, um, as we know, uh, don't uh, necessarily require huge steps and don't necessarily have to require huge concessions, but they can be seen at small, um, small uh, sort of low, low levels um, on issues of uh, religious tourism in the climate of COVID, obviously health diplomacy. Um, and I think over time with greater trust and investment um, on bigger issues like maritime security, um, sort of these are issues that impact all of the regional states um, quite um, equally. Uh, so trying to facilitate and manage these dialogues and these multiple tracks, um, I, I think would uh, be a sort of a vehicle uh, to building trust, building confidence, and ultimately thinking about conflict stabilization and management um, in the region.
Um, ultimately, uh, if you look at the Middle East, most of the states, particularly those around the Persian Gulf, um, very much face a lot of the similar security, environmental, uh, and domestic challenges. Um, they also, um, all of them, um, for better or worse, engage in um, similar destabilizing activity of supporting proxy groups, developing indigenous um, defense programs, um, if not, of course, of course, uh, this uh, potential um, pattern of nuclear programs um, that uh, is of growing concern. There is a detention of nationals, dual nationals, that we have seen um, also escalate um, regionally. Of course, Iran um, plays a particularly um, a strong role and, and, and a negative role in, in detaining nationals and dual nationals. So um, leveling the playing field and, and trying to address um, regional, regionally address uh, some of these challenging issues is sort of my view on um, the way forward to de-escalate um, and, and manage these tensions. Obviously for the international community, this requires a, a massive investment. Um, and and um, this investment is coming at a time uh, where uh, governments are um, overworked, resources are being redirected to the domestic crisis of COVID and the economic recovery that we will have to build back to. Um, but I would argue, um, above all, you know, the Middle East, particularly for European countries, is no longer so far away. Um, the challenges uh, from the Middle East are quite close uh, for Europe in particular. So um, taking a leading role in conflict management and stabilization, I think, would be in the long-term interest of European states um, so I see a, a more collaborative um, multilateral investment um, uh, that uh, European states can play alongside uh, the United States um, uh, with the uh, presence of a more engaged Biden administration. I'll stop there. Um, sorry for talking for too long and uh, looking forward to uh, engaging in some discussion afterwards. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Sanam, for this very comprehensive uh, presentation, of course. Uh, it's very difficult to to concentrate uh, the speech presentation when the issues are so complex. But I retain some of the elements you you mentioned that are particularly interesting also for the subsequent discussion we may have. And clearly, uh, one is the question of time. Time is of an essence uh, for for the region, uh, not only for the question of the return of uh, to the GCPOA, but also for uh, the interlink that. Uh, all the diplomatic processes may have amongst themselves uh, and uh, action continues to unfold in the ground. And uh, uh, so that uh, question is important. But I also retain the question you mentioned that uh, some of these uh, processes uh, that, that can be regionalized and multilateralized, if you want, may start small with small uh, steps, uh, confidence building measures which do not necessarily cost a lot of money or uh, political capital. So that those are quite important uh, elements for the discussion. Uh, I would now perhaps move to uh, Titi Erasdo. Titi, uh, please, the floor is yours. Yeah, thank you very much for inviting me to talk in this, um, on this interesting and topical topic. So in my brief talk, I'll, I'll um, argue that although confidence building would be needed to reduce the risk of war in the Gulf, the high level of hostility, deep mistrust, and vast military asymmetries currently limit the scope for their application. However, such measures could play an important role as part of a more comprehensive policy aimed at improving both US-Iranian and regional relations. And if successful, such a policy could also gradually maybe open up possibilities for more ambitious confidence building measures that might currently seem out of reach. So as we have all seen, Gulf security has deteriorated alarmingly over the past two years. The United States and Iran have come dangerously close to war and other Gulf states have become the battleground for this conflict. And the waters of the Gulf have also become less secure with tankers being seized and attacked and close encounters taking place between the US and Iranian navies. And according to a narrative that is dominant, especially in the United States, many of these incidents are examples of Iran's so-called malign regional behavior. And some recent maritime security efforts, such as Operation Sentinel, are based on this kind of a threat perception. However, this narrative and the related uh, approach to maritime approaches to 
uh, maritime security in the Gulf tends to omit one key background factor, uh, which is the escalation of the US-Iranian conflict since the United States pulled out of the 2015 nuclear deal or the, or the JCPOA. And of course, the JCPOA is a non-proliferation agreement that is strictly focused on the nuclear issue. But yet it has already had a significant impact on regional security. Although this hasn't always been appreciated by other countries in the region, the JCPOA actually made the region much safer by removing the imminent threat of war over Iran's nuclear program. And reversely, the erosion of the agreement has clearly undermined regional security. And these uh, more recent problems really began when the United States reimposed, reimposed the oil and banking sanctions in late 2018, and especially after it revoked the remaining waivers on Iranian oil exports uh, the following May. Since then, Iran has basically been prevented from doing any kind of trade or at least paying for, um, I mean, at least for using um, the international financial channels. And initially, Iran threatened to respond to this maximum pressure policy by closing the Strait of Hormuz. And anticipating such self-inflicted escalation, the Trump administration increased its military presence in the region, uh, actually right after revoking the oil waivers. As it turned out, however, Iran opted for a more asymmetrical response, targeting other countries' oil trade and shipments through the Gulf. Um, and compared to overt war, this presented a risky but still ris less risky way for Iran to signal that the maximum pressure policy had a price. So the fact that the US withdrawal from the nuclear deal was justified in terms of regional security was just among the many paradoxes of the Trump administration's policies because instead security in the region has clearly worsened. But of course now with the change of the US administration, there's a chance to undo some of the damage that has been done in the past four years, which brings me to the question of military confidence building measures that is the focus of this panel. And I think military confidence building would definitely be needed to reduce the risk of unintentional escalation. For example, Iran and the United States could establish the kind of hotline that was proposed by the international crisis group in their recent report, namely they suggested um, a mediated communication channel to prevent misinterpretation between US and Iranian navies when encountering crisis situations. As also suggested by the report, such a channel could eventually be turned into a direct hotline, which in turn could pave the way for US-Iranian incidents at sea agreement. However, I think these more ambitious steps would require a broader political confidence building strategy. Indeed, the most important de-escalation step at the moment would be political, namely restoring the JCPOA. Uh, because in addition to being an arms control agreement, the nuclear deal was also uh, kind of a tool of US-Iranian conflict management. And with Biden's stated intention to rejoin the agreement, there is thus a chance to start repairing that process. And as far as this succeeds and the oil and banking sanctions on Iran are removed, I think this would also remove a ma major course of current tensions in the Gulf. And in the context of lowered hostility that this could create, uh, I think the proposed US-Iranian hotline could also be more effective. And naturally it would be easier if the United States removed the Revolutionary Guards from its state, state sponsors, um, state sponsor of terrorism list uh, to make communication easier. Um, and I would uh, also point out that the current sanctions and terrorism designations, for example, they are related to a more fundamental challenge that is the nature of the US-Iranian conflict which doesn't easily render itself to military confidence building measures. Because traditionally such measures are, are based on some kind of a basic respect for the other side's security needs and sovereignty. 
For example, the Vienna document on confidence and security building measures built on the OSC principles. Um, the first one of which is actually sovereign equality. But when it comes to the US-Iranian relationship, there is really no such respect. After all, the United States has long labeled Iran as a rogue re regime, suggesting that it doesn't really deserve sovereign rights precisely because of its irregular conduct. Um, and given this starting point of hostility and distrust, um, I guess it's obvious that um, any ambitious Vienna style confidence and security building measures like me meetings of military officials or visits to each other's military facilities are uh, quite unthinkable, at least in the near future, and at least um, on bil bilateral basis. And a related challenge to confidence building is the power disparity between these two countries. Uh, for example, greater transparency about the overwhelming US military capabilities would, would probably not do much to reassure Iran, whereas revealing explicit details on Iranian capabilities might might actually expose some weaknesses, potentially making Iran more vulnerable to preventive US or Israeli strikes. Um, and uh, confidence security building, uh, confidence building measures also tend to assume some sort of military symmetry. For example, the Vienna document was accompanied, accompanied in Europe by the Treaty on Conventional Armed Forces, or the CFE Treaty, which sought to establish a balance of conventional forces in the continent. But again, in the Middle Eastern context, um, it's very far from balanced. So the point um, I wish to make here is that the logic of military confidence building requires a mutual recognition of each side's security needs, um, which should also take power asymmetries into account. And I think this also has implications on the missile issue uh, on which the Biden administration apparently wishes to have follow on talks because Iran used missiles as a way to bridge those asymmetries. Um, and apart from the need for US Iranian confidence building uh, process, there's also a need to address tensions among regional actors um, because the regional problems or tensions are of course um, a problem in themselves, but they also fuel the US-Iranian conflict. But reversely improved regional relations could reduce regional tensions and also contribute to the US-Iranian um, confidence building process. The good news here is that Iran has long called for regional dialogue, at least since the early 1990s. And countries like Kuwait, the United Arab Emirates, Oman and Qatar have showed openness to this idea. And, um, and Oman has also mediated between the US and Iran and Iraq has actually mediated between Iran and Saudi Arabia. And, and another good news is that some officials in the Biden administration have also called for regional dialogue involving Iran. So I think this can be seen as a new opportunity for broader regional dialogue if the new administration in the United States is really willing to promote it, notably by pushing the more reluctant countries like Saudi Arabia to engage with Iran. Um, and Despite the inevitable skepticism around any idea of regional cooperation in the Middle East, there are actually also some encouraging historical precedents. First, some of the Gulf states actually have experience on discussing military confidence and security building measures based on the Madrid peace process from the early 90s. Um, as part of that process or the so-called um, arms control and regional security talks, they actually managed to draft a complete text of um, an incidence at sea agreement with Israel. Uh, of course, that agreement was never eventually implemented due to the collapse of the Arab-Israeli peace process at the time, but this gives hope or it can be seen to give hope that a similar agreement could also be achieved among Gulf Arab states and Iran. Um, 
and um, Saudi Arabia and Iran, they of course have a um, very tense relationship, but they also haven't always been enemies. And in the early 90s, they also agreed on a comprehensive package to revive relations, leading, for example, to joint security accords to combat terrorism and organized crime. So the Saudi-Iranian rapprochement is also not completely unthinkable. However, it's hard to imagine any regional dialogue or maritime security agreements going very far as long as the JCPOA is not restored. For example, some people have suggested a freedom of shipping agreement, but what would such freedom mean in a context where one of the regional actors is prevented from trade of any kind through sanctions. However, if the JCPOA is restored, um, I think regional dialogue could actually complement the US-Iranian confidence building process, because many of the challenges that limit the prospects for bilateral confidence building might not apply to the regional settings, which would allow for more reciprocal steps. So even if a US-Iranian incidence at C agreement would initially not would initially not seem possible, maybe a similar agreement among regional actors could also indirectly re regulate US and Iranian interactions. Other options include, include establishing regional security centers or pre-notification of military exercises, which were, by the way, also discussed as part of the arms control and regional security talks. Uh, and even in the absence of such uh, ambitious formal agreements, regional dialogue uh, for its, I mean, just the fact that these countries would sit at the same table talking could help address the worst threat perceptions, which in turn could facilitate the US-Iranian confidence building process, for example, by reducing future, future US incentives to revert back to maximum pressure after uh, four years when the new US president might be chosen. Um, however, the US support for regional dialogue would require quite a fundamental change in the way that it has traditionally approached security in the Middle East, because the traditional approach has been based on excluding Iran. So I think there's a need for a more inclusive regional security paradigm that is based on some sort of balance that all can accept and benefit from. I don't necessarily mean um, parity. I think that's um, hard to think of, especially um, with the ally alliances in the region, but, but some, something that everyone can live with. Um, and related to this point, I also don't think that any potential follow-on talks to the JCPOA on other issues will get very far if they continue to be framed according to the old paradigm or if they are pursued only in the Iran P5 plus one context. So to conclude, if I still have time, uh, a comprehensive approach to confidence building in the Gulf would be needed and the first step is to restore the JCPOA. And this political step should be accompanied or maybe followed by modest military confidence building measures such as the proposed US-Iranian hotline to prevent accidental escalation, which is still a possibility. And the next step, as I argued, should be regional dialogue among Iran and Gulf Arab countries in which connection confidence building measures such as an incidence at sea agreement could be explored. And even if this dialogue uh, would not immediately lead to major breakthroughs, it could alleviate worst threat perceptions and thus also complement the US-Iranian um, confidence building process based on the, the restored nuclear deal. But um, ideally this regional process could lead to more formal and institutionalized uh, confidence building measures. Yeah, I think that was it from my part, part and I'm looking forward to your questions and comments. Thank you, thank you very much, Titi. Uh, I think uh, uh, very important points. Uh, first, that it's obviously uh, the return uh, uh, to the GCPOA and the strengthening of the GCPOA could indeed represent that 
uh, element the, uh, of, um, that could lead to further uh, uh, regional dialogues and restore a minimum degree of confidence which is needed to advance in uh, the other process of confidence in building and security I mean, on the military and the security side. So um, last but not least, uh, Masarui, please, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you so much for organizing this panel on this very important and timely topic. And it's really a pleasure to be part of um, uh, this panel to discuss these issues. I have to give a disclaimer that um, everything that I present today is my personal views and based on my personal research and does not represent necessarily the views of uh, US government, Department of Defense or the National Defense University. Um, I tried to sort of scratch some of my notes as, as um, other, you know, as Titi, Sanam and, and Giovanni, uh, you know, presented a lot of great points uh, about the context of the issue and, and, and the ways forward. So I'm just going to focus on, on a few things uh, to allow also some time for uh, more time for, for discussion and Q&A to get into more details. I agree with the colleagues on, on this sort of two-step process, and I think uh, from the statements that we are hearing uh, in, in the US uh, and even back in Tehran, there is this understanding that there has to be a two-step process. Um, and I'll get into sort of some details on that. And I really like what uh, Giovanni mentioned about the new start that we shouldn't look at it as a, as a we should look at it as a beginning and, and not an end. And I think it, this is exactly the concept that applies as we we're discussing the JCPOA versus other um, issues in the region that we should really think of the JCPOA as a beginning of a, of a very long process. Um, and I wanna even emphasize that, um, you know, as, as we talk about we, you know, the JCPOA and then other issues in a sort of more long-term concept, you know, uh, context, whether regional or missile, et cetera, even the nuclear issue itself, even if we just think of the JCPOA and the nuclear negotiations with Iran, we should really still see the JCPOA as a beginning because it's, it's a long process. It was viewed as to be a very long process to sort of normalize Iran's nuclear program over you know, many years and, and ensure its uh, peaceful nature. Um, and this is important because a lot of the sort of expectations in the aftermath or the criticism of the JCPOA um, expected sort of an immediate change in Iran's you know, policies in all realms and Iran's strategy. And this is just not how arms controls work. And if you look at other arms control agreements and, and the history of things, there are clear indications that these are processes, they take long, they, they're not gonna be over month things. Yes, you will see slow, you know, incremental results, but then, you know, these processes will, will take a very long time. Um, to, to come into play and then to be sort of uh, more concrete and to establish that kind, kind of con confidence building or, or trust building measures. Um, one quick point I sort of that I, I will I will mention about sort of the JCPOA and the and the swift return, uh, and then I'll move on to mostly the the, the regional issues. And that's um, I agree with Sanam about the, 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 the ticking clock and uh, Iran is sort of this February 21st deadline that Sanam mentioned. It's a, there's a lot of, you know, a building up of leverage and pressure. In fact, I'm sort of writing now about this issue of leverage. And um, the, the really, the, the, in reality, the timeline is not until um, Iranian elections. It's only if you know, potentially a few weeks, sometime in March, because if, if, if history is any indication and we look back at Khatami administration uh, and the transition to a sort of more hardline president Ahmadinejad, I, and, and at the same time uh, that I'm talking about, President Rouhani was the head of the nuclear negotiating team. So if there is no prospect of reviving the JCPOA, it is very likely that the Rouhani government will need to take more drastic measures itself before leaving uh, so that it does not seem 
um, it, as, a, as a show of strength to its sort of uh, political, you know, it, it, its uh, political hot, uh, opposition, the hardliners in Iran. So I personally believe they will not just wait until the election without, uh, you know, taking this a step further. Um, if there is no sort of um, kickstart or, 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 or a confirmed prospect for reviving the JCPOA. So I think that's something to keep in mind. And that's why there is this February 21st deadline, because really the timeline is much more limited than, than thinking about um, the June election. That aside, uh, I want to talk about sort of the, the follow on and the next step and, 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 you know, give a little bit of sort of more general overview of, of things and, and, and the challenges and things that potentially need to be done. Again, one of the criticisms that was mentioned uh, towards the JCPOA was that it did not uh, change Iran's activities elsewhere, particularly sort of support for non-state actors in the region in, in Syria is sort of the example that is, con you know, continuously being brought up. And, and, and that goes back, I think, to um, the fact that we need a better understanding that, you know, Iran sort of, if you, if you think of Iran sort of uh, strategy, there are three main pillars to it. And that's, you know, I'm going to just try to sort of very briefly mention, but the nuclear, the missiles, and the regional, uh, you know, uh, activities or network, its network of influence are really the three pillars. And you cannot expect um, that they will let go of all three at the same time uh, and make concessions on all three at the same time. It, it is just, for, for any country, that's sort of an unrealistic expectation. And as I've said it elsewhere, it's sort of, it, it, it's basically requesting surrender. And you can only do so if you have defeated uh, a, a country in a war, uh, not in the negotiations. So it's really important and, 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 and it ignores the fact that the drivers for each of these pillars, while they're very intertwined, they could be very different. So for instance, a, a nuclear agreement is not the driver behind Iran's policy in Syria. The, the, activity, the, the, the dynamic situation of the conflict in Syria is what drives Iran's policy in Syria. And so I, I think that becomes, in, in when, when it's simplified a lot of times in the media and in, in policy discussions, people tend to ignore that there are several um, levels to this whole sort of to, to Iran's policy, and that has to be considered. And obviously, they're not going to, because they made an agreement on a nuclear issue, they're not going to suddenly change all of their policies on, on other areas. And that gets to the point of, uh, as you know, they have always stated, and, and TT also mentioned, um, the best way to address those areas is in a regional context. And another reason why it's important to do so in a, in a, in a, in a, in a, in a regional context, um, and I think actually uh, the, the new national security advisor, Jake Sullivan, has also uh, mentioned this, uh, stated this, that th these have to be sort of a more inclusive uh, regional context where, where we resolve these issues with Iran, is that the priorities of the P5 plus one in terms of what activities are concerning about Iran is very different from of the, of, of those of Saudi Arabia's or Israel's or, or UAE. And so the type of, you know, the, the, the way U.S. prioritizes obviously non-proliferation is on top of the U.S. agenda. Whereas if you talk to um, people in, in, in Riyadh uh, or, or, or from UAE, they are more concerned about Iran's missiles and, and short range missiles versus again for Europe and US, the long range missiles are, are more of a concern. And so this is just an example to say that the priorities are very different. And so the, the context that these issues need to be discussed should be very different. Um, it's something that again I'm, I'm, I've been working on for a long time through the 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 the, the, the track two and track one and a half that I organized, but more so in, in a project that I'm now working with a colleague, uh, Robert Dannon, which we just put out a piece about this idea of, you know, yes, there are so many different challenges in this context. But it's not the first time in, in the history of international relations that we're dealing with a situation like this. And it is complex. There are competing interests. There are uh, conflicting interests. Um, but we can still not apply a European model, because obviously every region and every time has its own setup. But we could learn lessons from how, for instance, the European uh, 
uh, or the Helsinki process worked and what can we learn from those processes or other arms control agreements that worked successfully in the past and try to help sort of present a, a forum which we are sort of proposing a, a Middle East forum. And, you know, again, while it, it should be sort of, it, it should be all inclusive, um, and yes, there is the reason why these, uh, you know, uh, regional uh, dialogues are not all inclusive is the, is the concern about the spoiler effect. But really, there is no way to make progress if, uh, unless there is an inclusive, um, uh, you know, forum. Um, but I also think because in the Middle East, the, the, the external stakeholders have such a invested interest in, in different parts. I cannot imagine a, a, a regional process where it excludes external actors. And I don't even think some of the regional countries will be comfortable enough engaging in negotiations if they're not, uh, you know, if, if the US is not presented or some of the European governments are not presented, uh, et cetera. So there, there has to be an, you know, a, a, a forum where it allows for engagement and dialogue. And I think there are two things that I want to mention that is, 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 is really important. And there were great ideas, you know, by, by Sanam and Titi about sort of short term uh, measures and sort of what's important for the, in, in the long run. Um, you know, I, I do think there has to be a, a, a sort of a prospect for where this dialogue is going. So I, I think there has to be multiple tracks um, that consider different issues and they have to be done, not necessarily in a particular order, but simultaneously in parallel tracks um, to just, you know, to just allow dialogue between the stakeholders, between the, you know, different actors. And, you know, it's, it just, there, it's always striking to me how much lack of understanding of the other side's threat perception exists when it comes uh, to the Persian Gulf particularly. And so just to, to, just to be able to um, create that understanding of each side's threat perceptions and, and national interest and, and vital interest and what are each side's red lines, what is really threatening and to find those root causes of that um, I think is by itself very valuable. While it might not have immediate results, but it's a it's a process, and it's you know I, I I truly believe in incrementalism when it comes to these issues, as to sort of start with like you know smaller measures, but allow for discussing more ambitious agendas as well. There's no reason why the countries cannot in a track discuss more ambitious arms control ideas. Yes, it's not gonna result in any kind of agreement in the next year or two or five years, but unless they're discussed routinely on, on a regular basis, you know, there's, you know, the, the other smaller, you know, trust building measures, while they're great, they're not gonna just immediately translate into more ambitious, um, arms control agreements. There has to be discussions on sort of the contours of it, what it would look like. And, and again, that's where I think the, um, some of the experts or former officials who have the experience of um, these difficult circumstances, arms control agreements can participate as, as, a, as observers to sort of offer some uh, you know, out of the box ideas on how you know, they, can, they can rethink the way they're already thinking about these issues. Um, and, I, and I give sort of a brief example and I, I, I end with that point, which is, Prior to the JCPOA, I remember participating in many different events and everybody was like, it is impossible to come to an agreement because the US wants zero enrichment, zero enrichment is a red line for Iran, there were even articles written about it, so there is no room for, for, for finding an agreement. And when it came down to having a, a very good team of having technical experts and bringing them also into the discussion, I think that was that was a game changer. Obviously, there were many factors playing into negotiating, so I don't want to diminish, uh, you know, the the success of the or the the agreement of the JCPOA to just this. But this idea of looking, okay, let's come out of this sort of where we're stuck on the enrichment. Think about how we can find a solution that we could still prevent or or, or resolve the, the the problem that the West has about the enrichment, which is the root cause was to prevent Iran from a nuclear weapon. Let's find ways that we can still limit that um, 
but allow some enrichment. And that's how sort of the, you know, the, the, there was a common ground that was found and, and moved forward. And I think it's very similar when we think about the regional issues and while they're a lot more complex than I understand that, there's so many ways to find, you know, um, you know out of the box ideas and, and solutions that might not necessarily be possible if, you know, there was not enough talking and discussions about sort of the, the root causes of what sort of uh, creating these kinds of um, conflict. So I think it would be essential um, to do so. And I wanna sort of finish by, by, by saying that another reason, even if we put aside uh, the Iranian election cycle and, and, and that as a reason for reviving the JCPOA in a, in a, in a, in a swift, sort of swiftly and in a quick manner, Another important is that the sooner the JCPOA is resolved, or as I think Jake Sullivan recently said, the nuclear issue is in the box, the sooner the US and others can dedicate all this diplomatic effort and investments that they have into these other issues and thinking about how they can create sort of a more inclusive regional discussion, how they can address other issues with Iran and sort of engage and find a, find a resolution. Because so long as this nuclear issue in the JCPOA is hanging like this, other than for the reasons that TT mentioned that, you know, it, it would create a difficult situation for Iran, there's nobody has enough, you know, given everybody's domestic um, challenges, Europeans, Americans, everybody, there's just not enough, uh, you know, uh, diplomatic capital to invest on other issues. So it's really important to take advantage of this opportunity where there is a U.S. administration that has sort of the willingness to engage diplomatically with Iran on these issues. And I really hope working on a project on missed opportunities between U.S. and Iran for several years, I really hope that in a few years we're not looking back at this and think what a missed opportunity um, it, it was. So I, I really hope that we can sort of start rethinking the way we think uh, about leverage, about uh, engagement, about resolving the, the issues and, and, and go beyond thinking these are like impossible or very ambitious. Um, we, can, we can tackle more ambitious agendas. It's just a matter of the, the willingness and the investment of diplomatic effort. Thank you very much, uh, Massa. Uh, indeed, I like to turn it around and not talk about missing of missed opportunities, but uh, windows of opportunities that net need to be uh, used. Uh, and uh, certainly, the the important question you mentioned about the inclusiveness of the region-wide dialogue, including external actors, uh, is is one of the keys to.